I'm driving my SLR McLaren out of Barrett Jackson right now. The cheapest SLR McLaren in the USA. Holy the dumbest automotive channel in all of YouTube. And yes, I did just purchase this. It's the most expensive car I have ever bought in my entire life. And it is a 2008 Mercedes SLR McLaren Roadster. Now, you know I recently sold a lot of cars at the Barrett Jackson Houston auction. That netted me about $260,000. And well, it's all gone. It all went into this. Shortly after the Superbird sold, this thing crossed the block and well, I couldn't help myself, especially with the story that it had. Only 3,000 miles on it and it may or may not have been on fire once, but now I need to get this car back to Wichita, Kansas. It only has 3,000 miles on it, so it's probably never had a multi-state road trip, but we are going to fix that today. But first, a little history of the SLR McLaren, which I think is criminally underappreciated as it's one of the best automotive partnerships in all time. So Mercedes to celebrate the 300 SLR, the Sterling Moss legendary race cars of the 1950s, built a concept that was unveiled at the 1999 North American Auto Show called the SLR. Just like the car of the 1950s, SLR means super light racing, and the car was so well received that they wanted to put it in production, but they didn't have the means to do a small batch car to do so. But McLaren had just wrapped production of their F1. They had a completely idle facility, so they partnered up with McLaren to build this car. So Mercedes did the design, but McLaren engineered everything from the ground up on this car and then took a Mercedes 5.5 liter supercharged V8, stuffed it in here in an amazing way. Same goes with the Mercedes automatic transmission and the latest tech from Mercedes, but the chassis itself, the engineering, this entire car is a McLaren. It is the lost link between the F1 and then the modern full production cars, the MP4 12C. And this one, well, was expensive. I did pay, well, $300,000 with fees, but if you look up SLR Roadsters for sale, uh, that's way way less, almost half, than the next cheapest one for sale in the country. And why is that? Well, it's quite a story, which actually we need to get on the road, so I'll tell you about it during the drive, and hopefully we have no issues going home, and then I can give you a more thorough tour of this incredibly special machine. <laughs> This car is pretty astounding. 617 horsepower, zero to 60 in a little under four seconds. And oh man, <laughs> that exhaust note, since it comes out the side, kind of near your feet, it's unlike anything else. God, that throaty sort of AMG V8 noise <laughs> coming out side pipes. It's just absolutely unreal. The supercharger just screams too. What an experience this car is. You know, and it's not all that uncomfortable either. Ed Bullion had one of these famously. It was Paris Hilton's old car and he complained about the seats. It's a one piece seat that doesn't recline, but it does tilt back pretty far. Not quite far enough for me, but I am like 10 or 15 years younger than Ed Bullion and much more limber and flexible. So I'm having no problems comfort wise in this thing. But let's get to the story of this car. So I actually bought this from Collins Brothers Jeep, Dennis Collins. They had to sell this car at auction for uh, personal reasons, and they actually bought it from Wayne Carini. So it goes from Wayne Carini to Dennis Collins, Collins Brothers Jeep, and then me. But uh, somewhere before Dennis Collins and somewhere I think after or before Wayne Carini, a little problem happened to this car. It was, uh, well, maybe El Flambe. So it actually sold at a gooding auction in Scottsdale in January 2016 for $400,000. That's about when these cars were at their cheapest. And then by July or August, something happened. 
There is a fuse block somewhere under the hood that I'm sure was built by the British, certainly not German, that melted down. And when it did, it uh, scorched some wiring harness wires with it, uh, quite a few, to where Mercedes wanted to completely replace the whole wiring harness in the car. They didn't want to splice and repair the wires, and that apparently was going to be a six-month wait. And the part itself, I was told, which I thought was pretty reasonable, $10,000 for a new wiring harness, you know, like miles and miles of wiring inside the car to replace it, and then, well, like 100 hours to replace the wiring harness to get through all the nooks and crannies, probably an engine out, grand total $50,000. But the big thing, about a six-month wait for Mercedes to build a new wiring harness, which, you know, when you think about it, that's pretty reasonable. But I guess that the previous owner didn't want to wait. So they just, they just turned it into insurance, Haggerty apparently, and Haggerty just took the car, waited for it to get fixed, didn't salvage it, it's a clean title car, and then sold it on. The thing about it is that happened in 16. It didn't show up on the Carfax until 2019. So kind of a bummer there, but I think there's something we can do about it. But this car, it is ridiculously fast. It can get up to triple digits really fast without you even thinking about it. And then if you want to stop, you have carbon ceramic brakes and an air brake. Look at this. <laughs> How incredible is that? But then since it has all the Mercedes tech, I have all the comforts, including cruise control. So this is going to be a wonderful, wonderful trip home, except Texas drivers and traffic are always a challenge. So wish me luck. Well, I got home late in the evening in what was probably record time for me, thanks to this car, not only because it's really fast, but also because I did not want to quit driving it. Two quick stops, it averaged over 17 miles per gallon, a giant tank in it, so it lasts three or four hours driving, which is pretty good, but it makes sense for this type of car. This was supposed to be a high-speed grand touring car, not like the Carrera GT, not like the Enzo Ferrari, which it was compared against when it was new. This was something entirely different. I guess this has more in common with a Bugatti Veyron since that was built to just go as fast as possible and this was a 200 plus mile per hour car. Now I didn't get anywhere close to that but certainly see the capability. And now it's finally starting to sink in that I own one of these. I was reviewing the footage last night and I was very reserved. I think I was just shocked that I was able to get one of these cars or maybe that I spent that much money but now I mean it feels totally worth it, especially when you think of all the cars that I just mentioned, the Carrera GT, multi-million dollar car at this point, the Enzo Ferrari in the millions of millions, the Bugatti Veyron over a million dollars, and this car in its time was in the same league of the best of the best, the upper level crazy supercars of the 2000s, but it's the only one that has remained, well, I guess reasonable, $300,000 is still a lot of money. But in comparison, this is the only one that hasn't appreciated well beyond its original MSRP. And I'm not sure why, but I sure am happy because that means, well, I have this car in my garage. Now, my history with this car goes way, way back. This will be a little bit of a glow up before and after if I can dig up these photos, but I first drove one of these back in 2009 or 10. I was with the Mercedes-Benz Club of America and organized a poker run, and we stopped at one of my dad's friend's houses. He was in commercial real estate, and he had an SLR McLaren Coupe that he drove a lot. I think it had 20 or 30,000 miles on it. We showed up at his house. I set this up hoping we could stop at his house to see the car and then move on to the next stop. And he asked if I wanted to drive it, which of course I wanted to. So I took it out for a drive and then he said, well, I'd love everyone else to experience this car. So if you want to give anyone else a ride, you certainly can. So I got to spend an hour plus in that car, absolutely flogging it for people because that's what he encouraged me to do and was instantly in love. I was 22 or 23 years old at the time. And then, well, over 10 years later, I'm on Jay Leno's show, Jay Leno's Garage. He blindfolds me in three cars and I have to guess what I'm riding in just on the other senses other than visual. And one of the cars was his SLR McLaren. And of course, I knew instantly the moment he started it up, it was a special Mercedes with the weird doors and then the side pipe exhaust at your feet. I mean, pretty obvious what it was instantly, but it was interesting. It was that car, a Carrera GT, and a 65 Shelby GT350R. I guessed all three right. And a few years ago, I was considering buying one of these. I actually had negotiated and somewhat made a deal on a coupe 
2,000 miles on it, but it had been modified a little bit, black wheels, all things that could be easily reversed, but still a very low mileage car, but it needed a lot of service because it wasn't used. But then I went with the SLS AMG because I was scared of the maintenance with the SLR McLaren, which is pretty considerable. With these, it has a 6.2 liter V8 that's very accessible, a dual clutch transmission that is fairly reliable, a modern, nice Mercedes. With this, it was built in England, engineered by McLaren, and they weren't thinking about ease of maintenance with this car at all, which you'll see when we pop the hood. But popping it is actually quite a thing here. You have the normal hood latch, very Mercedes-esque there, but then the way it opens is very unique. You have two handles on either side, so I'm gonna have to put you down for a little bit to do this. I'm pulling it back. I'll get it just enough to where, there we go. I got it just enough where two handles are unlatched and then it pulls out, but it doesn't go up. It actually folds the other way, making for a very dramatic reveal of this AMG V8 under here, which actually starts right here, just behind the hub of the wheels. So it's technically mid engine. The other wild part is this air intake, which if you look, the Mercedes crest is actually drawing in air to the engine, which is insane. The radiator's cooled by air that comes into the grill. You can see the radiator right here, this crazy suspension setup, but there are all the belts and the accessories buried deep into this thing. Look how much has to come off just to change a drive belt or something. But even worse, the spark plugs, they are under here. There is one ignition coil popping out right here in a spark plug, but then you have, well, three more on this side getting buried into the engine. And for the first several years of these cars, servicing them, changing the spark plugs, the ignition coils was an engine out job until somebody figured out a different way. But that's how tight things are in here. You can see they have a lot of heat dissipation. That makes these hood vents functional for the headers. You actually have two little reservoirs for the intercoolers, but they make fluid top offs pretty easy. This is where the oil goes in, I believe. And you can see the big reservoir for the radiator there. Now on this side, you have the reservoir for something, probably power steering, I'm not sure, but the steering is very, very firm on this car. When I first started driving it, I thought something was broken with the power steering, but that's how these cars are. And then brake fluid, which I believe in the trunk, there is another reservoir, which is where the electronic braking, the SBC pump lives. But you can see how tightly packed everything is in this car. And it is a fully carbon fiber body with tons of carbon fiber panels absolutely everywhere, even underneath. I believe this was the first full production carbon fiber bodied car. And this hump here, all it does is house the exhaust. You can see all the heat shielding in here. So all these vents on the side are actually functional to dissipate heat from the exhaust because the mufflers are hanging out up here and feeds out to the side pipe exhaust down here. So it is pretty quiet when you drive it under normal circumstances, but then when you get on it, the side pipe exhaust, well, you heard it, it's so incredible. Down here as well on these turbine wheels, you see carbon ceramic brakes, which I believe this is one of the first full production cars to have carbon ceramics on them, certainly the first Mercedes. The butterfly doors are a really cool party trick here. You can see the hinge is right there. That's why it's retained on the Roadsters. Unlike the SLS, the gullwing is hinged from the roof, so the Roadsters are just normal doors. The one-piece carbon fiber seats, which I talked about earlier, they are gorgeous and, well, reasonably comfortable. I was kind of surprised with that one. But then when you're in and you start looking around at the components, it looks like a pretty no-nonsense Mercedes other than the McLaren symbol down here. Very basic gauges, very Mercedes with the same buttons. Even the stereo hidden behind here, it matches up other than the silver trim with a Mercedes C-Class. There's no switches of any kind or handles on the door. It's all down here with the power seats, the windows, and then this is the latch to open the door. Since the latch mechanism is right here, the door just has a hook on it. But starting it up, it is the coolest sequence ever. You feel like Tom Cruise in Top Gun because you flip this button up and there is your engine start. Eel 20 Fox 1. <laughs> How cool is that? Climate control, also pretty normal Mercedes. You see it's in auto mode right now, but then you can flip it out and it changes to change which vents you want the air to blow out of. And you see this in the middle, that is the test function for the air brake. So you can wave it, people, or you can just deploy it all the time right there and look cool all the time, I suppose. And then you have the transmission modes, which in manual, then you can up the shifts here. That all is for the trans. Down here on a half million dollar car, when new, you have dummy buttons that do absolutely nothing, which is 
hilarious. But then the top's controlled here. You hit this button to close. And what I like about it is it's a very simple top operation. You actually have to do some work. So basically like one motor, that's it. You have to pull down and finish the job yourself. So nice. I don't have to worry about some ultra complicated top braking. Easy peasy. No glove box, just the airbag, so you have a little bit of storage here, but not all that much. Just enough so people don't complain, but then, oh, I haven't opened this up before. What do we have here? Is that a, looks like a Bluetooth module, okay. Well, that's really cool. When we exit the vehicle, you can see the roll bar right here along with the wind deflector that has SLR in the glass. And then this top material is an interesting space age kind of weight saving material that Mercedes was bragging about back in the day. And then the taillights, well, look at these crazy things. They are just absolutely awesome along with the trunk space, which is absolutely cavernous. And apparently this is where the fire happened around where the battery and the battery cables and the fuse box. The only thing that looks amiss is there's a panel missing so all the wiring is exposed here, but otherwise I don't see any evidence of fire damage. So that fire damage on the Carfax was a bunch of hubbub. Just basically made this thing affordable for me to actually be able to buy it. Now I did have to write a little check on top of all the cars I sold the Superbird, everything else, but absolutely, absolutely worth it for an icon I am so dang happy. But if you think this is the last car I bought at Barrett-Jackson, well, uh, you don't know me very well. Uh, I bought more, a few more. I've lost my mind. Thank you so much for watching.